Effective Christian ministry depends not only on ability or skill, but on love, on care and concern for other people's well-being. When I need to get home, you're my guide in life, you're my guide in Over the summer, we're taking the opportunity to select and rerun some of our most requested messages from Charles Price. In the coming weeks, we'll broadcast various sermons from a number of previously aired series. The Word of God is timeless, and clear biblical teaching is perpetually applicable. Join us as we revisit some of Charles Price's most sought-after messages. This is Living Truth. Let me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm going to begin by reading the last verse of chapter 12 and then leading right into chapter 13. And Paul says, the end of chapter 12, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you a most excellent way. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. That is probably one of the best known descriptions of love in all of literature. And without doubt, one of the most profound descriptions of love. 50 years ago, Perry Como sang, Love Makes the World Go Round. Some of you can remember that. Well, I'm calling my message this morning, Love Makes the Church Go Round. Because this passage is not a treaty on love. This passage is a treaty on spiritual gifts. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks there about spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts, he says. He describes what they are. And then in chapter 13, he talks about spiritual gifts exercised without love. And it all becomes empty and noisy, just a clanging, discordant symbol. And then in chapter 14, he talks about the exercise of spiritual gifts with love. And you find in chapter 14, it's all about encouraging people, building people up, and benefiting other people. And so when he wrote this section on spiritual gifts, he wrote this most profound 
passage on love, not to explain love, but to explain how the church of Jesus Christ is designed to function and to work. And that's where we're going to look at that this morning because we're talking over a number of weeks about the church of Jesus Christ. What is it? How does it work? What is it supposed to do? And we've talked about the fact that one of the most important descriptions of the church is as being the body of Christ. He is the head. His spirit is its life. And we individuals are members of it. We are mutually dependent upon each other, though we are different to each other. We've talked all about that. And Paul, in writing of that, says, but I want you to know that though you speak in the tongues of men and angels and prophesy, etc., etc., but you have not loved, the whole thing is bankrupt and empty and comes to nothing. Now, this word love doesn't do us any favors these days because it's a word which covers a multitude of things. You know, I can say to you, I love my wife, Hillary, which is true. I can say to you, I love ice cream, which is true. I can say I love beautiful weather, which is true. But of course, I'm using one word, love, to describe a whole variety of things that have very different meanings. In our English language, it was confusing to the Greeks as well, but they were smarter than we are. They came up with three different words for love, describing different facets of love. There's the word eros, which is used of romantic love and sexual attraction. The word erotic in English comes from that word eros. It's not a bad word, but it, it describes an emotional love, an interdependent love between a man and a woman. That's the word eros in Greek. And then there's the word philio, which is about friendship and uh, a warm relationship with somebody else, with an acquaintance. The name of the city, Philadelphia, means brotherly love. Philio, love, and Delphi, brother. Philadelphia is brotherly love. That's mean that word. That's more, if you like, a marrying of minds, a marrying of interests. That is... uh, That that is uh, an intellectual love. If um, eros is a sort of face-to-face love, philio is a side-by-side love, common interest moving in a certain direction. And then there's a third Greek word. It is the word agape. Now, it's not used very much by the Greeks, probably because its experience is rare. But it is the word that is used here in 1 Corinthians 15. And it's about an attitude towards other people. If eros is emotional and filio is intellectual, agape is volitional. That is, it's an attitude of caring towards other people, whatever you feel about them, an attitude that seeks their well-being. I think one of the best descriptions of it is in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2 when Paul says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And then he explains what he means by that. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves, or actually the NASB translates that I think a little bit better. It says, in humility, consider others more important than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And he describes this love there as an attitude towards other people that says, in this given situation, whether I like you or whether I don't, that's irrelevant. You are more important to me than I am. How do you know when somebody loves you? Well, you feel important to them, don't you? When do you begin to question if somebody loves you? When you wonder how important you are to them. Because love is this attitude of regarding others as more important than ourselves, as Paul words it there. And so when he writes this in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, I'm not just changing the subject now to talk about love. I'm still talking about how the church functions and how spiritual gifts are to be exercised. Because if you put these chapters together, he says the master of operations in the church is Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body. The method of the operations of the church 
are people whom he gifts and equips and gives different functions to, but the means by which the church is to operate is by love. Effective Christian ministry depends not only on ability or skill, but on love, on care and concern for other people's well-being. Now, I'm going to divide this chapter into three. If that isn't uh, sort of sacrilegious, it's such a profound and beautiful chapter. We don't want to break it up. But just to help our thinking about this, there do seem to be three movements in this chapter. And the first three verses I want to call the futility of spiritual gifts without love. And then the next Verses, verse 4 to 7, he talks about the fruit of spiritual gifts exercised in love, what they actually do for people as they're exercised in love. And then thirdly, the last verse is the finality of love over spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are temporary. Love is permanent. And we look at that uh, thirdly. First of all, let's talk about the futility of spiritual gifts over love. Because having described a variety of spiritual gifts... Some of them are very impressive. Many of them are miraculous in their operation. He then begins chapter 13 with that little word, if. And he uses it four times in these three verses. If I speak in the tongues of men. Let me pause there. If I have great eloquence and I'm able to move people with my eloquence. If I have the gifts of men and of angels, and almost certainly he's referring there to the gift of tongues that he's just talked about a little earlier, where a person expresses mysteries with his spirit, as Paul describes it in chapter 14, the tongues of angels. If I have the tongues of men, if I exercise the tongues of angels, if I have the gift of prophecy, that is, I have insights into events that I can speak into those situations with clarity. If I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, that is, if I have a wonderful grasp of the revelation that God has given to us, if I have faith that can move mountains, if I have such a trust and confidence in God that Dramatic things happen as a result of my trust in him. If I give all I possess to the poor, that is if I move with extreme generosity, all I possess I give to the poor. If I surrender my body to the flames, that is if I'm willing even to go to the extent of martyrdom. If I have all of these things, he says, and these are wonderful things, beautiful things. They're the things of which books are made, of which biographies are written, about which films are made about which testimonies are given, all these qualities glitter in front of us like gold. They impress us, they motivate us, they mobilize us, but the proverb is never truer than here, that all that glitters is not gold. Because he says, if I have all of these, but I have not love, I am nothing. He says, I gain nothing. I am only a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. Think about it. Without love, these beautiful things are just gongs and cymbals and noise. But what Paul is saying here is that you can have all the spiritual gifts in the world. You can be exercising them with finesse and impress people with them. If they're not exercised in love, they're just clanging cymbals, noise, without melody, without harmony. If love is not the motive of speech, whether it's human or angelic, he says, it's nothing. If love is not the motive of prophecy, it's nothing. If love is not the motive in great acts of faith, it comes to nothing, he says. If love is not the motive in acts of benevolence, it comes to nothing. If love is not the motive in a martyr's death, it will gain nothing. It's just noise and excitement. 
Why do you think love is held up as such a high virtue in this passage and in Scripture generally? There's one very clear reason, of course. God is love. By the way, as an aside, please don't reverse that love is not God. But God is in his nature, in his character, in his being. He is love. And that statement is made twice in the letter of 1 John in your New Testament. And because God is love, the mark of genuine spiritual activity is the measure to which God himself is active in that activity. And when he is active in that activity, he is love. Do you know something? You can, you can mimic all the spiritual gifts. You can have counterfeit of all the spiritual gifts, but you cannot counterfeit love. You can counterfeit, of course, a smarmy sort of, uh, you know, pretense that is love, but it'll all come out eventually that it's not. And if we detach, and this is part of this message of, of 1 Corinthians 13, if we detach the work of God and the works of God, which are accomplished through these spiritual gifts, if we detach the works of God from God himself, and from the character of God. They simply become an expression of ourselves on display for the applause of men. But if it's God doing these things, the very fact that God is love will begin to be expressed through us and create a trail that takes those we're ministering to in whatever way it is, it gives them the trail back to God himself. And the frightful thing is that we may receive spiritual gifts from God and then detach them from God and exercise them as purely a human activity, but it becomes nothing. And Paul is saying, you want to understand how the church of Jesus Christ is designed to work. You want to understand how it is that God operates through the gifts that he has given to men and women. You better understand that the means by which these gifts are to be offered if they're going to be fruitful is in love. Now, of course, we can sit here this morning as I have sat at my desk this week and thought to myself, this is a wonderful ideal, but is it actually Practical. I mean, is this going to help this morning? Is it just like dropping? Well, you remember how they used to put a carrot in front of the donkey's nose? You probably don't remember that. Some of you do. But some would sit on the cart attached to a donkey with a little sort of fishing pole with a carrot on the end of it, dangling in front of the donkey's nose. Donkeys like carrots. That's a carrot. I'd like a carrot. Moves to get the carrot, pulls the cart. The cart pulls the man sitting on the cart with the fishing pole and the, and the carrot keeps moving, but he never actually gets it. That's how you got donkeys to move, apparently, back in the old days. I mean, is that, this morning we're going to go away and say, yeah, I, I like that idea, but, you know, it, it's out here somewhere. Where can I ever get hold of it? Can I ever live this way? Can I ever experience this? Is Paul teasing the people in Corinth with this kind of statement? Is this limited to some special saints, you know, like Francis of Assisi, who, yeah, now in history can wipe out all the bad things. Yeah, he was a good guy. Mother Teresa. But we'll never experience this. I want to show you that Paul is stating here, this is not the prerogative of a few. This is to be the possession of all. Now, I'll tell you why I can say that with some confidence. Of all the churches that Paul founded in the New Testament, the church in Corinth was the most immature. It was the most divided. It was a deeply divided church, 
people were following after different leaders and fighting over it back in the early chapters. There was sexual immorality going on in the church in Corinth that Paul said is not even named amongst the pagans. And yet Christians are doing it. People were coming to the Lord's Supper, the communion service, and they were getting drunk. They didn't give little sips. They had the, the whole glass and knock it back, and they were getting drunk. And Paul talks to them about that. They had misunderstood some basic fundamental doctrines that Paul has to go back to and says, you know, when he gets towards the end of this, he says, you know, what exactly is the gospel? Let me tell you in case you've missed all of this. And he just outlines the work of Jesus Christ in chapter 15. They were misunderstanding spiritual gifts. That's why he writes so much about spiritual gifts. And he begins it by saying, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant because very clearly they were ignorant. So if there was ever a church in Paul's personal experience that was a mess, it was this church in Corinth. And if we knew this church or were part of this church, we'd probably write it off as a hopeless mess. But it's to this very messed up, divided church that was engaging in all these kind of wrong and sometimes evil acts that he says, it is you that I want to know can experience this love as the means by which you engage in ministry to one another. And spiritual gifts, he says later, I told you that chapter 12 is about spiritual gifts. Chapter 13 is what happens when you have spiritual gifts without love. It's just a clanging noise. And chapter 14 is what happens when you exercise spiritual gifts with love. And he says you put priority on gifts that are designed for their strengthening, their encouragement and comfort. He says in verse 3, so follow after gifts that build people up, he says, because it's about exercising them in love. Whatever God gives you to do, whatever God gives me to do, it's to be measured by the benefit it brings to other people as we exercise it in love. Often when I go off to preach, my wife will say to me as I leave the house, don't forget to love the people. And she said that to me for 28 years now. And I say to her now, when she goes off to preach as well, don't forget to love the people. Because that is what you're there to do. Tell them everything you know. Don't forget to love them. And that's what Paul is saying here. So the futility of spiritual gifts without love is it's just a noise. It accomplishes nothing and you gain nothing. Secondly, from verse 4 to 7, he then talks about the, the sort of virtues, the attributes of love, and I call this the fruit of spiritual gifts exercised in love. And he describes what love looks like. And he gives 14 virtues in verses 4 to 7. Seven are positive, what love is, and seven are negative, what love is not and does not do. Let me read it to you. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. What a beautiful, beautiful statement. And most of us hear those verses read at weddings because that's usually the time that we look for something that's really brilliant about love. And this is one of the most brilliant statements in all of literature about love. 
But when you read it through and you read these quarters, does it ring a bell in the minds of some of you who know the scriptures? If it does, it probably rings a bell from Galatians 5 that talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Paul says there that every one of us as Christian people now are indwelt by our own natural human nature. We have that. And we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The problem is, he says, that the flesh, the old nature, fights against the Spirit and the Spirit fights against the flesh. And he says, if the flesh has its way, this is what it does and gives you the works of the flesh and a whole list of dirty things. He says, that is what you're capable of. That is what's natural to you. If no one's looking and there are no consequences, you would do them. But then he says, but there is fruit of the Spirit. If the Spirit is at work in your life and dominating your life, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if you put that list alongside the qualities of love, you'll discover that if Paul had said the fruit of the Spirit is love, he would have included all the rest already because they're all expressions of love. Now, if we had the time, we could have spent a lot of time going through this list of 14, seven positive, seven negative virtues, one by one. We're not going to do that because that would be to miss the whole point. It's not that, well, here's, here's one patience and here's one kindness and here's one uh, always protects, here's one rejoices with the truth, here's one always perseveres. You know, what, what, what's your score? And you say, well, I got about 75%. Okay, well, that's pretty good. You know, try and get 80 next time. That's how we might tend to respond to going it through it one by one. But it's like the fruit of the Spirit. It's not a plural statement. It's a singular statement. When Paul talked about the fruit of the Spirit, he didn't say the fruits of the Spirit are one, two, three, four, nine of them, plural. He says the fruit of the Spirit is singular. One root, nine fruit. It's the root, it's the spirit will produce these things. And so it is true here. And we can take these verses and we can personalize them. I just read to you them as they stand in our text. But just let me read them a second time. And let me take out the word love and replace it with the name Jesus Christ. And as I read it, see if this makes sense. Jesus Christ is patient. Jesus Christ is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus Christ does not delight in evil, but he rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because these qualities, not simply isolated things, one here, one here, one here, one here, they are the fruit, the expression of one root. They are the life of Jesus Christ. They are the character of Jesus Christ, the character of God. Let me recommend something to you. And I recommend you do this once in a while. I'm not greatly introspective myself, but once in a while I've found this to be Painful but helpful. Get alone. Close the door. Maybe on your knees. Read these verses. Take out the word love and put your own name there and see if it makes sense. I wouldn't dare read it to you with my name there. But read it with your name is patient is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And as I've read that, you've probably thought of your own name there, and it probably depresses you incredibly, as it does me. 
But when you read this and you put your name there, you can turn to God and say, God, thank you. This is your agenda in me. This is what you are committed to in me. You are committed to expressing the very character of your son in me. You see, the goal of the Christian life is Christ-likeness. It is character. And this spells out what that looks like in real terms. And I want to recommend that you get along with God and read this. And if you do it too often, you'll either become hardened to it or you'll be an, an insensitive or it'll depress you so much, it won't help you much. But as you read it and you say, I'm a long way from this, but thank you, Lord Jesus, this is the goal that you have in me and I want you, Lord Jesus, to express your character in me. And of course, by the way, you will never see it in yourself because you know that for all these things, there's a battle that goes on. Other people may see it. They'll see it a lot more clear than you do. But if the church of Jesus Christ is the function, the way it's designed to function, the master of the church is Christ, who is the head of the body. The method of the church is people to whom he has given spiritual gifts, and through whom he will do the work. But the means of the church's ministry is that we love. That we love one another. And we love those who may seem to be unlovely because it's not about an emotional connection initially. It's about a volitional agape. You're more important to me than I am. And then the third thing as the futility of spiritual gifts without love, and then the fruit of spiritual gifts exercised in love. And the last section is about the finality of love over spiritual gifts, because verse 8 begins, love never fails. And then in the following few verses, if you read it carefully, he contrasts the transient nature of spiritual gifts and the temporary nature of spiritual gifts with the permanent nature and the eternal nature of love. So he says in verse 8, where there are prophecies, they will cease. will not need them anymore. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where the tongues of men or the tongues of angels, you won't need them in the way in which they're spoken of here as the means of accomplishing the work of God as spiritual gifts. Where there is knowledge, it'll pass away. Not that we'll have no knowledge, the day will come when we will have full knowledge, of course. But he's saying that these things, valuable as they are now, are actually only partial as they stand already, but there is a permanent thing which never fails and will never cease that comes alongside and you need to hook, hitch your wagon, if you like, to the permanent and be known for being a person of love, not a person who's got this gift or that gift or the other gift. That's what's permanent. Now he says in verse 9, we know only in part. And he uses several analogies. I used to think like a child and reason like a child and engage in things that were childish, but then I became a man. And he's saying, you know, you're living in the childish phase right now, but you're one day going to be a man when all these things pass away. He says, now we see a poor reflection in a mirror. We see things thrown back to us and it's inadequate and it's not accurate, but then we're going to see face to face and be fully I'm going to fully know as I am presently fully known by God. I'm going to arrive there. But in this world, in this time, it's just a poor reflection anyway. Now I know only in part, he says in verse 9, then I am to fully know. So there's all this temporary transient things that we can so often 
hook ourselves to, and they become the all-important things, but there is something which never fails, which is not going to run out, which is, you're not going to graduate from, and it is love. It is the character of God expressed in your life. Verse 13 says, Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Those three qualities that are indispensable to the Christian life. It's by faith that we come to know Christ. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. We cannot save ourselves. He saves us in response to our faith. We live in dependence upon him. We live with hope. That is, we're not wrapped up in the now. We're looking ahead and love. But he says, the greatest of these is love. So what is really important to the church of Jesus Christ? What is it that really gives to us a cutting edge? What is it that changes us? What is it that makes us significant in the city in which God has put us? What is it that breaks into the hearts, sometimes the most hardened hearts of other people? It's our love. So he says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Follow love. That is what you're following. Oh, and by the way, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, but don't follow them. They follow the pursuit of love. That is, the first thing about you is you actually love the people and therefore you minister to them in the way in which God has gifted us. You love your neighbor and therefore you bless your neighbor in the way God enables you to. I'm going to tell you a story I've told before from this platform, so some of you have heard it. Some of you who are here and I told it before have forgotten it. (laughs) And for those of you who do remember it, you'll benefit from hearing it again. But it's a story that challenged me tremendously. I was invited some years ago now to speak at a conference of pastors in the city of Boston in the United States, It's organized by the New England Association of Evangelicals. New England, of course, is the six states in the northeastern part of the United States. And they came together for this conference, and there were several speakers. And one of them was a man called Juan Carlos Ortiz. He was a pastor of a church in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And he told a message. He gave us a message, should I say, one day that challenged me Thoroughly. He told us he'd gone to Buenos Aires to pastor a church of 300 people, and it had begun to grow very quickly, and it soon became a thousand people. And he said he became known as the pastor of the, of the fastest growing church in Buenos Aires. And he was delighted with the reputation that gave him, he said. He said one Sunday morning he had planned to preach a message on love. During the week, he prepared his message and he came to the church that morning very confident of what he wanted to say. And he sat on the platform during the time of worship and music and during that time, he felt a very strong impulse that he should not preach his message. But he had nothing else to say. When the time came for his uh, sermon, the, the worship leader said, And now Brother Juan Carlos will bring us this message. And he said, I came to the platform, I opened my Bible, and I said, brothers and sisters, my text this morning is love one another. And he stopped, closed his Bible, and he went back to his seat. And there was silence. And with the silence, there was confusion. The worship leader leaned across and said, are we supposed to sing another song? But he sat there quietly, and after about two minutes, which is a long time when you don't know what is happening, he told us that he got up, came back to the pulpit, and he said, brothers and sisters, my text this morning is love one another. And he went back to his seat. He said his wife was sitting in the balcony, and she thought, he's flipped. (laughs) I knew it would come one day. 
After a couple of minutes of silence again, he got up a third time, came to the pulpit, said, Brothers and sisters, my text this morning is love one another. And I think it was after the third time. And he went back to his seat that somebody sitting somewhere in the congregation turned to a person next to them and said, excuse me, I don't know you. Is there any way I can love you? Somebody else turned to somebody else, somewhere else in the congregation and said, excuse me, is there something I could do for you? And within a few minutes, the whole church was alive with people talking to each other. He said, we had 28 people in the church that morning who were unemployed. Every single one went home with a job. He said, and he began to give other statistics, and I was writing fast, and I, I haven't got the figures exactly, but he said there were single mothers with children in the congregation that morning who were struggling alone, and every one of them went home with a family committed to help them and share with them, help take some of the burden with them. He listed other things. He said... That Sunday morning changed our church. He said, if I'd preached my message on love, people would have come to me, shaken my hand, said, brother, P Pastor Ortiz, that was, that was a good message. I really enjoyed that. I especially like the differences you explained between the different kinds of love. And they would have said all that. But he said, 28 people would have gone home unemployed. And to be utterly honest, he said, most of the church couldn't have cared less. But something happened that day. He said, the next Sunday, I got up to, for, the, for the message and I said, brothers and sisters, my text this morning is the same as last week. Love one another. Went and sat down and people said, well, who can I help this week? He said, I didn't have any liberty to preach for three months. I just said, here's my text. Love one another. Go to it. He said, 300 people left the church. They said, we don't employ you to stand up and say, love one another. We want you to teach us the word. But he said, for those who stayed, who really didn't want just to know the word, they wanted to obey the word, and they were discovering that it was obeyable. If there is such a word as that. Their lives, their relationships began to change. Now, let me say this. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> because that was, a, that was a divine moment in that particular time. But I do want to ask you the question. Did you come here this morning expecting to bless somebody? To minister to somebody? Did you come here this morning and when this service is over in a few minutes, are you going to look for people to talk to? Are you going to be bold enough if they tell you something's wrong to say, can I help you? Because they might say yes. Were you going to talk to the person next to you who you don't know? Or just get up and go. Have you thought you might invite some stranger home for lunch? Or out to a restaurant with you for lunch? I'm only asking you the question. Because when a church begins to live, not just in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the life and character of God begins to flow into the community. And I want to ask you this morning, is this the kind of church we want to be or do we want to be a safe, easy, be as comfortable as you want to be kind of church? But please don't expect me to take these things seriously. How is the Christ life in you. For as we've seen, Christ is the head of the body, his spirit is its life. And the life of Jesus indwelling us by the Holy Spirit is totally committed to loving through you and through me. 
if this isn't the kind of Christian we want to be, if this isn't the kind of church we want to be and recognize we need to be and recognize we are instructed to be and recognize we have the resources to be, we're better shutting up shop. Because if you have the tongues of men and of angels, if you engage in all kinds of activities that other people applaud from a distance, but you do not have love, and you're not kind and patient and long-suffering and trusting and all the other qualities that are there, then you're just a noise. And all the neighbors ever think of us is we're glad when the service is over on Sunday because then they can park their cars outside their houses. There's no sense. Here are people who actually care. And I'm preaching to myself. And I've preached to myself all week, not just that, but I have brought my own heart once again to the cross of Jesus Christ where all this is made possible. But it's not lots of individuals Paul is talking about. He's talking about the church in this chapter. This is how the church, made up of individuals, is going to function. When Jesus shared the gospel, he spoke in all kinds of ways. He communicated with parables, metaphors, and life lessons. Jesus wasn't just entertaining people. He was delivering a life-changing message with language that was relevant and meaningful for the masses. In the Great Commission, Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. For many of us, we want to do more to engage the world with the good news, but it's challenging, maybe even impossible, to find the means to share beyond the orbit of our everyday lives. We live in a time when the phenomenon of media allows us to transcend borders and languages, to connect with people all around the globe in accessible ways. Living Truth is a ministry that harnesses the power of media to share Jesus with the world. For the past 40 years, we've gathered together with people from around the world to study the word and share the good news. Through television, radio, and digital media, Living Truth produces clear biblical teaching that allows people to experience Christ in their own homes, across the street, across our nation, and around the world. For some who are unable to attend a local church, Living Truth has become their church community. God is using this ministry to reach the masses. We invite you to join us, of course, to continue to gather with us, but also to engage the world with the good news by financially supporting Living Truth. Our production team is hard at work all year long to produce 52 weeks of programming. In a ministry of this scope, there are ever-present production costs, and summer is a financially critical season for us. We're halfway through our year, and we rely entirely on viewer support to top up our ongoing creative costs and keep us on sound financial footing. We're reaching out to loyal supporters like you to ask you to help us reach our goal of $200,000 for our production fund. By partnering with us in whatever amount you can afford and whatever frequency you can manage, you provide quality programming that communicates the saving love of Jesus to all those who are willing to hear. And every amount you donate is stewarded faithfully to send this message to the nations. We regularly receive notes from viewers living all around the world whose lives have been changed because they met Jesus or grew in their faith because of living truth. Without your contributions to this program, we simply wouldn't be able to share the gospel through media, locally or globally. To offer your financial support to Living Truth, send a check to the address on your screen or call 1-888-269-6085 and make a donation with your credit card. Or you can make a secure donation online at livingtruth.ca. You can also text DONATE to our toll-free number. Living Truth is a registered charity and all donations are tax-deductible. Thank you for your faithful and generous support. Thank you for believing in living truth and for supporting our production costs. 
In this world that has both unprecedented connectedness and unbelievable brokenness, together we can go and make disciples of many, many nations. We wish you a safe and enjoyable summer. God bless you. Summer is finally here, and so is the Living Truth Summer Sale. This summer, be inspired with clear biblical teaching. Order now and take advantage of the Living Truth Summer Sale with some of our most sought after messages by Charles Price. This summer, fill your spirit with series like The Word of God, Exodus, Job, Gender and Sexuality, and many more to choose from. Learn at home, give to a friend, or plan a group Bible study. To order this series, write to the address on your screen or call toll-free 1-888-269-6085. To order online, visit livingtruth.ca or simply text BUY to our toll-free number. This summer, experience the transforming power of God's Word. Order your series today. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 is where on a mountainside in Galilee, Jesus calls on his followers to baptize all nations. It's become a principle in emphasizing ministry, missionary work, evangelism, and baptism. As we interact with the world around us, we can rest in the knowledge that God wants us to reach out to others with his love. We need to be active participants in loving and forgiving. This is a wonderful gift we can offer to those around us. And we can do this knowing that Christ himself is God's gift to us. Join us next time for more clear biblical teaching here on Living Truth. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcasts. You can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. Join us next week as we continue our summer series with more messages from Charles Price. This is Living Truth. Night is 
Your generous contributions support the work of Living Truth, the media ministry of the People's Church Toronto. We are committed to the highest level of transparency and accountability. If any approved project target has been met, the remaining contributions will be used where most needed as determined by Living Truth.